All right, we're close enough to the right time, I think. Oh, no. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Internet of, of, of Things. Yeah, anyway, so they got network address translation. As you know, there's different kinds, but um, typically you want network address translation with port address translation, so many devices can share the same uh, IP address. ART is used to resolve uh, IP addresses down to MAC addresses. You typically configure an end device with a, a default gateway, but it cannot find, cannot send traffic to an IP address on a local area network. It needs a MAC address, so it uses ARP to resolve an IP address down to a MAC address. This is why most network traffic is all ARP traffic. Um, and unfortunately, ARP traffic, um, the, the whole fundamental security problem of all networking is it was all designed without taking security into consideration. So ARPs have no password, no encryption, no authentication of any kind. So if you send a request saying, where is the gateway, anybody can reply. And you have no way to tell the genuine reply from a fake reply, so now there is ARP poisoning. Available, a, an attacker can just send false ARP traffic on a network and redirect packets to put themselves in the middle, and you, there's nothing in the protocol to prevent that. Yeah. Just go back for a second. Yeah. And so um, the ARP is used to find the MAC addresses. Now, if they are random. That's right. If they were, well, if they were random, um, but they usually they only change when you reboot things. Okay. So if you were to reboot the router and get a new random address, all the clients would request it and find the new one. So it would be okay. However, um, this that. Normally, I don't think anybody is intending to randomize the ARP addresses of gateways and routers. They just want to randomize the address of clients for privacy. Not servers. Not, not servers, not although server. in principle you could, and it wouldn't matter because, for example, you could just buy a new router and just use it. That's a different address and everything's fine. And you could just replace the NIC card on a server or replace the server entirely. You don't have to reconfigure the network because of this. It will automatically find the new address. Never randomize it? Uh, there, no, Sorry, no, there are actually different protocols. Um, some of them do it periodically. Okay. Um, there are different different procedures and different techniques, yeah, different operating system. Macs didn't used to do it at all, but I think now they do. And I think Windows just announced they're going to start doing it, and there are several different ways to do it. There are even people that argue about whether the randomization is sufficiently random. There are different mathematical protocols. People worry about this stuff greatly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, each device is still only consuming one address. What it might mean is that you would get a new address after randomizing your ARP, but it would still be only consuming one, I guess. Yes, uh, there will undoubtedly be problems like that. I know one of my first jobs when I was a de facto server administrator was we had NetWare, and NetWare had a 25 user license, and we had 40 users. Everybody I know did this. So that meant and it would remember them all day, but only 25 people were using it at a time. So I had to go in several times a day and delete the unused NetWare sessions so it wouldn't fit within the license. It was a common problem. That will, that will actually, are you parallel to the Yeah. That will kill my parallel it is now a yearly license and it reports the hack address is registered. And yeah. it knows that it oh, I, oh, that, I didn't know anybody actually used the MAC address for software licensing. Oh, yeah, that'll be an issue. And that's why whenever you do a transition of anything, like a server or a protocol, the, man, the vendor always says, oh, it'll be fine. And it always isn't fine because you have all these ad hoc things in your company that are using details of the current system in ways you didn't expect. Like, I'm sure nobody thought, you would software license to the MAC address. They say, I'll just replace this NIC and it'll be fine. Well, so what if you replace the NIC, your software license is no good? Yeah, you gotta go back to the manufacturer. Oh, man. That's what happened with the ID printer, bad printer. Oh man, that's rude. They sold a license that's yeah. uh, tied to the MAC address of the computer. We had a problem yeah. where the computer died. Yeah, yeah. Get a new license. 
Yeah, yeah, that's an issue. <coughs> I know um, the Windows XP activation, if you go to another machine, it, or if you change the hard drive in the motherboard, it can decide that you're a new computer and you have to pay again. So there's a phone activation, and my students learned that if you call the phone activation, you can activate it like 20 times at the same license. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyway. Yeah, this whole uh, activation thing is a huge problem. And it's the same thing RIA has. There's no good way to make a fingerprint of your machine. And all, many, many systems have been tried, and they're all defective in various ways. So there's art poisoning. The attacker lies and claims to be the gateway. So now all the traffic that's supposed to go out the gateway passes through the attacker first. And now they're in a privileged man in the middle position so they can alter traffic coming in and out. Of course, if you're using a VPN, it wouldn't matter because they'd only be getting encrypted stuff they couldn't open. But other kinds of traffic they might be able to get away with modifying. Unicast traffic is what almost everything is on the internet. One receiver, one sender. Your multicast is where one sender sends packets that go to multiple recipients. This is, in practice, not used for much of anything except things like routing protocol updates. Uh, so broadcast is where you send traffic to every device on the network. Um, this was very popular in very early networks, but it created a lot of excess traffic on the network, so it was um, reduced in future networks. The directed broadcast at layer three, where you put in the network address and fill in all the rest, the host addresses with one used to be allowed, but this caused the Smurf attack, a, a, a first packet amplification attack on the internet. You could send a directed broadcast over the internet to go to someplace like your college, hit a thousand devices, and now for every ping you send, a thousand replies would come, which would then go to your victim. So these are now no longer permitted on the internet. And so uh, any directed broadcast traffic is discarded by the internet router. You can use them on local area networks, but not on the internet. In fact, there's a fun thing I do to my college I'm in. You can test to see if we have network uh, isolation here. So if I do my F config, because the Mac doesn't even let me use the non-deprecated command IP, because the Mac, like everyone else, doesn't care about their stinking deprecation. So EN0 is my wireless adapter. So here I have... Uh, 10, 0, 1, 10, 154, and my net mask is 255, So this is class C. So there's the directed broadcast address. So if I ping that, I get only one reply. But if I ping the undirected broadcast address, I still get only one reply. That's good. So this router has host isolation, which is what they have at Starbucks. Every one of you is on a separate VLAN. So this means if one of you were to share a, um, a file and I tried to reach it, I wouldn't be able to reach it because we're separate, which is usually the way you want it to be on wireless networks. At my college, it's not. And at airports, it's not, by the way, although I don't recommend hacking airports much because the TSA has no sense of humor. But anyway, you, you can ping and you'll see all these other devices on the network because they haven't got host isolation turned on. Anyway, um, so that's the Smurf attack. Okay, uh, you can normal, normally your network card in the hardware, or in, in the firmware on the card, every packet, that, every frame that comes in, it compares to Ethernet address with the Ethernet the MAC address on there and it doesn't pass anything into the computer unless it has a matching MAC address. You can turn that off and put your card in promiscuous mode so it lets you see everything that comes in, but there is normally no need to do that. And in fact, uh, Microsoft has a whole series of products to detect network cards in promiscuous mode as a security violation. Um, anyway, you, um, this is important mostly on wireless networks now. On switched networks, you don't get any traffic that's not intended for you anyway, hardly, so it's kind of useless to be in promiscuous mode. On old hub networks, it was worth it because you get packets that weren't intended to you. And on wireless networks, you get packets that aren't intended to you just from the nature of the light because you are spraying them everywhere. You get it directly, even if the host is in isolation mode. So anyway, um, switches isolate traffic segments. So here's the TCP header, uh, layer four. So you have source and destination port numbers that are 16 bits long. You have the SYN and ACK and FIN and RESET flags and other things here that you can use to organize packets. So the first 1,024 ports are called well-known and reserved for um, known system process, uh, known server processes like THCTP and Telnet and HTTPS, and you cannot listen on these ports without administrator rights on a server. The rest of them are used as ephemeral ports. There used to be a distinction between those below 49,000 and the ones above 49,000, but Microsoft completely ignored it. 
and used the ones around 1100 in Windows XP as ephemeral ports when it should have been above 49,000 and basically destroyed that separation for all practical purposes. Although later versions of Windows like Vista and Windows, Windows 7 actually use them correctly again. Anyway, so once you ink a connection to a remote server, you have a local IP and a local port number and a remote IP and a remote port number, and those four numbers together form a socket. And now you can send traffic two ways, and it will not be mixed up with anybody else's traffic. It is not as secure as a VPN, but it's sort of like a VPN. It's like you had a wire from your computer to the server, and you can talk to each other like a telephone call. You're only going to hear that traffic, and all the other traffic moving down the wire will be separated by addresses. A, once you have made a socket, the socket has a state, and there is a state table. And so an established state is that means the TCP handshake has been finished with SYN, SYNAC, ACK, and it has not ended with a timeout or a FIN or a reset. So you have this session ready to go to send and receive data. This is important because modern firewalls are all stateful. They look at the state. And so you can now do what Windows does by default. It is a stateful firewall. So it makes you a client, but not a server, which is what you want to do for endpoint machines. So you can go anywhere. SINs are allowed to go out to anywhere. And traffic from the outside is only allowed to come in if it's part of an established session. So you can ask for data from anyone and receive it. But if anybody on the outside sends data you did not ask for, it bounces. So even if you turn on file sharing on your laptop, the other people in the coffee house cannot get to it because the firewall does not accept unaccepted SINs from the outside, unexpected SINs. That's a stateful firewall, and that's why almost all firewalls are now. So there's SYN, ACK, and these other ones like uh, FIN and such. And these other more exotic ones like congestion, window, reduced that are hardly ever used. So there's the handshake, SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK. UDP has no handshakes, no data acknowledgments, no flow control. You just spray data out like broadcast TV or radio with no information about whether anybody is receiving it or not. So it's therefore fast, but it, you don't really know if the data got there. It's called unreliable, which doesn't mean that it fails a lot. It just means that you do not have a receipt to prove that it got there. All right, so I should have another Kahoot, which I guess is gonna be 5A3. Let's see if I can get back, okay. 5A3 should be somewhere. Ah, 5A3, okay, good. This irritation is working. I'm thinking more and more I should just pay these Kahoot people. <laughs> oh, like two years, maybe three years. So, you know, that's what you do. You make the free people suffer until they get annoyed enough to pay. I, get, I teach Splunk, and you use the free version of Splunk, the way they punish you is there is no user accounts at all. Everybody is logging as administrator all the time. And that's, they say, how long are you gonna live with that? <laughs> Just like this, you know, irritates you, you're gonna have one, to say, every one of my students could delete all the data and ruin it. Nobody's done that yet, but they could. And so, are you ready to pay yet? <laughs> I think it's a good business model to give you some free version so you can learn and some motivation to pay. I think that's, I like that model. It's good for teachers because my students can use the free version. Anyway. So what kind of transmission uses that address? <laughs> Yep, that's the undirected broadcast address. It reaches every device on your LAN. So what ports require administrative privileges to listen on? <laughs> the well-known ports. What flag initiates a connection? SYN. Okay, what UDP flag initiates a connection?
good. You people, I fool a lot of students, but not you guys. There's no connection. There's no flags. UDP does not have any of that stuff. Okay. So uh, that's Robert and B and T. Okay. All right. Now I say you folks know your net plus, and that gives you a big leg up in the CISSP world. All right. So ICMP sends these echo requests and echo replies and other information like this packet has been discarded because I couldn't find it in the routing table, packet undeliverable, and other messages. Um, this used to be very useful. It used to be the first step of hacking until Microsoft kind of got fed up with it in Windows XP Service Pack 2 and blocked all pings by default. And now you can hardly detect anything with pings except the Macs, which are probably not vulnerable. So you do not find the juiciest Windows targets you want to attack. So uh, ICMP is, in fact, not a whole lot of use anymore. And a lot of people block it. Anyway, Traceroute uses ICMP if you're using Windows. But if you're using Linux, it uses UDP or TCP by default. Anyway, Traceroute sends packets with a small time to live. So they get discarded after a couple of hops. And a reply comes back, an ICMP packet discarded packet message comes back and you can trace out the route to something if the ICMP is not blocked, but more and more operations block it at the firewalls. So trace routes are becoming less and less useful. More and more lines are just showing stars. All right. Um, Telnet was originally intended to move data from a console to a server and on one wire in a building. And then it was ported to the internet, which is a terrible idea because it sends passwords and data in the clear. So most Cisco classes teach you to maintain control Cisco routers with Telnet, which is a terrible idea. And it should just teach you how to use SSH from the start. Unfortunately, they don't. Every company should block Telnet and FTP at the border, and they should have been doing that for 30 years. They both send passwords in plain text, and that is ridiculous. And yet a ton of people keep using these protocols. So I'm one of the guys, a security engineer administrator, took my class like this. He was amazed to find out how many people are using stupid plain text protocols. And it's just like healthcare. The reason people suffer is because they do something that they know is stupid, that everybody has told them is stupid, like smoke, and they just do it anyway. And then they get sick and they're like, you know you're not supposed to do that. There's people send passwords in plain text, and then they wonder, why did I get hacked? You know, it's it's very Frustrating, and that's why I think management is apparently what is needed. You need to somehow convince people to do what you, everybody knows they should be doing instead of just doing the sloppy, easy thing, and that is the job of management. And um, it's not just making draconian rules. Microsoft Windows did this. In Vista, they in implemented user account control, and the early version of it was on in a, the most secure mode. So every administrative action required a pop-up box for approval. So everything you did, it would then pop up. This requires administrative approval. Is that okay? So it'd pop up 50 times a day. So everybody just turned it off. So it didn't do them any good at all. So in Windows 7, they made it less secure. So it only pops up for certain risky actions and not for normal um, operating system actions. And therefore, people left it on. So this is, very, this is a big issue. The most strict rule is not the most secure rule. The rule that people can actually live with is the one that will in fact improve security. <laughs> anyway, um, so FTP sends data. It's really old protocol. It's really strange in design. Not only does it send the data without encryption, it uses the ports in a very strange way, 20 and 21, and then a random high numbered port is used. So you have to configure a firewall to accept connections for any port number. It's, anyway, the old-fashioned FTP is pretty rotten, but people still use it somewhat. It'd be a whole lot better to just use uh, SSH and HTTPS instead. TFTP is Trivial File Transfer Protocol, which is used to update IP phones and Cisco routers over a LAN. It has no authentication at all, so you can just make a rogue TFTP server and reboot IP phones and send up poison firmware. <laughs> It is amazing. It was, again, one of these protocols like Telnet that was supposed to be used only down one wire from your device to the others, but then ported to a LAN or a WAN, and it is far too insecure to be trusted on a WAN. SSH is the secure replacement for Telnet. Unfortunately, like a lot of security improvements, the first version of SSH was incredibly badly written and had buffer overflows, so in fact, updating, upgrading to SSH made you less secure. Another black eye it had, but now that's been fixed. And it's still working backwards. 
sorry. <laughs> well, it's no longer as vulnerable. The huge disasters have gotten better, but you're right. There's huge arguments about it. Yeah. Anyway. Well, so as this, yeah. The problem was the key management. Yes, it's susceptible to management. What or what it is. <laughs> yep, that's why HTTPS is better. That SSH has no need to purchase certificates, and it, it is vulnerable to man in the middle attacks. Yes. Um, yeah. On what port is SSH or can you use any port? You can use any port, but the official one is 22. So if you want to use a different port, you have to specify that when you connect. Yeah. All right. Um, SMTP sends email from server to server. And if you want to receive email from a server into an email client, which I guess some people still use at businesses like Outlook, most people now use webmail like Gmail. But if you do download it to the client, you use POP or IMAP to do that. Um, the DNS is, of course, the place where you look up alphabetic domain names and turn them into IP addresses. There are a ton of DNS attacks. I teach a whole class in DNS security. There's a lot of issues there. It's really quite extravagant. And I say the latest hotness is now DOE, DNS over HTTPS. Um, that is the most popular way to actually improve privacy. Privacy is probably the main problem in DNS. Everything you do is being sent in plain text all over your network so anybody can see what you're doing. And that is just kind of nuts. Anyway, um, so you have a start of authority is the master copy of the DNS record for your company and all the rest are copies of that. Uh, recursive servers are what you have in your router where you ask the router what a DNS record where Yahoo or something is, and if it doesn't know, it will go ask somebody else and figure it out and tell you. So that's normally what you want. A caching server records DNS resolutions and does not ask again if someone tries to go to the same place. So that means it lowers the it's faster response and less network traffic under normal conditions, but it means if some bad information is fed into the cache, it will persist for a period of time and people will go to the wrong place, and there are quite a few attacks that poison DNS caches at various levels. So DNS uses UDP, so there's no authentication, and there's no encryption, and there's no security, so you can forge DNS responses, and you can't tell a genuine response from a real response like ARP, so there are poisoning attacks where you lie on the network about DNS resolution. Um, DNSSEC is the security enhancement intended to prevent servers from having their caches poisoned. It stops one particular attack, which Dan Kaminsky figured out around 2008, and it does stop that attack well, but it turns out to be extremely clumsy and difficult to deploy and expensive, and it doesn't stop most of the real problems with DNS that affect end users. So like IP version 6, it's been around for years, and no one can convince anybody to update to it. And so right now, it does absolutely nothing for you because your browsers don't enforce it. Um, it's slowly being rolled out um, by uh, the forward-thinking early adopters, and 90% of everyone is completely ignoring it, like IP version 6, and just wishing you would shut up about it and keep using the old thing without worrying. Um, you know, just yeah. Confidentiality If you wanted confidentiality, you would need encryption, and DNSSEC does not provide that. DNSSEC only provides um, a signature between routers. So if you make a, if you're a client and you go to a website, you're still using unencrypted UDP and DNSSEC does nothing for you. This is one of the main reasons why nobody bothers with it. It doesn't solve the actual big problem for the end user. All it does is stop the DNS server from getting a false update. And that was one specific attack, which was pretty powerful and scary, but there was a quick fix for that by just randomizing the source ports. So now there was another 16 bits of random number there. That turned out to be a patch that in fact was good enough. So largely DNSSEC is an expensive solution to a problem that is not a, not a significant problem. It just is open DNS for that. Open DNS is just a DNS server. Oh, they support it. Yeah. Oh, they, but you can't use it from the end device unless you go to the Firefox Experimental. There's nothing you can put on your end device that will pay attention to DNSSEC because almost no websites are signed. So if you block the unsigned websites, you couldn't use the internet. So it, that's why it doesn't have any value until everybody adopts it. And a bunch of people don't adopt it because they don't see any value, so you have a chicken and the egg problem. You can't get any value out of it until it has essentially 100% adoption. So right now, just a few forward-thinking people like Google and OpenDNS and the Internet Engineering Task Force adopted, and then they keep on saying, why don't all the rest of you do it? 
all you have to do is these 100 expensive steps and train retain all your staff. Why don't you do that? They're going to have to make it a whole lot easier if they expect anybody to go to it. Or they'd have to have government push. The U.S. government forced everyone to go to IP version 6 by they made a rule from that all government devices must be IPv6 compatible in the military by 2008 and in civilian government by 2010. So this is why Microsoft and Apple made their operating systems IPv6 compatible because if they hadn't, they would not have been able to sell to the government anymore. So they didn't pass a law requiring it, but they made it so that you'd be nuts not to put it in. That's what made everyone do it. But they have not done that for DNSSEC. So it's not rolling out in any time, any kind of hurry. So you can do uh, queries online. There's a lot of DNS looking glasses like this one where they will do a DNS query. And this is good because then you escape filtering. A lot of companies filter DNS. Starbucks does. My students in a DNS class uh, had to learn to quit trying to do their homework in coffee houses and stuff because people block and change DNS resolution using online looking glasses give you a more pure clean DNS response. So you can see DNS sec in action. Let me just do that. If I go to men and mice dig, um, you can see these things, uh, men and mice. Let's see if I can find it. If not, there's another one called, uh, all right, let's do um, a DNS looking glass. There's a few of them. Um, uh, See if this works. Otherwise, I'm going to have to maybe I have to put men and mice. Um, okay, let's try men and mice. There's a few of them I forget. There's one called uh, Ring of Saturn. There. There we go. Web based dig. This will give me a nice clean dig outside the network. And so, I, if I dig at, say, Google 8.8.8, whoa, stop that, at 8.8.8.8. And I Google IETF.org, the Internet Engineering Task Force, who, of course, write these standards so they obey them. I will get the output here. And they gave me only that. That's disturbing. Okay, let's see if I can dig any. Some people are deprecating any. Let's see if these guys will let me have any. Ah, there we go. So this is DNSSEC. The original DNS would just give you the IP address. Now it comes with a signature. So you get the information like the name of the start of authority, and this garbage down here is the DNSSEC signature, which is big and complicated, a cryptographic signature, like an HTTPS certificate, which verifies that this previous answer is in fact correct and from the right server. So now if you go through all the cryptographic calculation, you can prove that that is not a lie. And it is just like the HTTPS certificate authority chain. It is attested to by the server above it, and that is attested to by the server above it, and it all comes from the self-signed root app at dot. And that is attested to, like I say, by eight celebrities that meet every year in a ritual to verify that no one has changed the signature of the root. Mice and men doesn't do the What's that? I did the same thing for mice and men. Um, yeah. But it didn't yeah, maybe they took it down. But anyway, this, this, there's a bunch of DNS looking glasses, and I don't people put them up, and I don't, they don't make any money from it, so they come and no, go. I, I just did the same thing on my oh yeah. Did not the oh yeah. Well, that's you know the any is technically deprecated. You're not supposed to do it anymore. If you could explicitly ask for the signature with RR sig, and then you will get just the signatures. Although if you dig something like A or say quad A for example, quad A is the IPv6 address. If you get an address, it should be accompanied by a signature, and I don't know why it's not. But uh, yeah, anyway, that's, you can see it here, and um, people keep changing the rules. But one big problem is the original DNS specification specified that the maximum amount of data you can move is 512 bytes, which is why most people had 13 servers, because that's enough for 13 addresses. But with these signatures, it's not enough for hardly anything, so they had to update it. And there are several competing standards to make it bigger. One is extended DNS that lets you put 4,096 bytes in. Another is DNS over TCP instead of UDP, so you can send anything of any size, but it is technically much slower, especially for the server, where it consumes a lot more resources. And there are people screaming and fighting and yelling about how to do this. And a lot of people block the signatures and block TCP because they're an older network and they aren't using them. And, they, and so that's why it's not very clear 
when you do a query, what's going to happen? And these looking glasses are best if you actually want to see DNS in its plain form. Um, because people are trying to push out various updates and different people are adopting different portions of them, it's a confusing mess right now in detail. If you do anything other than the ordinary DNS lookups, which of course everybody has to make work. So there's an RR shig. And notice here, it could not send it over UDP. So it had to repeat in TCP on this network to get the big signature count. There are different protocols and different ways to evade the size limit. SNMP is a big scandal. SNMP is used to configure firewalls, servers, routers, and switches, and the early version sent passwords in plain text over the network. And then they made a later version that encrypted them, but a bunch of people have established equipment that speaks on the SNMP version 2. So even now, a lot of people continue to use SNMP version 2 and send uh, these community strings, which are passwords, unencrypted over the network. And anyway, most people just left them at their default value, which is public for public and private for private. So all your essential network infrastructure is about as secure as the Internet of Things, like webcams, the default password that nobody's changed. And a lot of people are still at this level. It's, um, this is the dirty little secret that a whole lot of hacking is just realizing how insecure stuff are. This is like the ATMs. I won't use ATMs in like convenience stores anymore because those little cheap ATM machines at like a 7-Eleven, they had just have a default password. There was like some two 17 years old in Florida to figure this out. You just go up and type in like one, two, three, four pound. You get to the administration page, you can just take the money. And so some kids figured this out. They went to the 7-Eleven and stole the money. Then they came back next week and stole the money. They came back next week and stole the money until eventually the cops were just there waiting for them. But it is that easy. And if, you, if it's not set to default, all you really have to do is pull out the power plug and put it back in, get back to default. And, you know, they're really not much more in there than your home router. And it's really not secure enough to be handling money, in my opinion. <laughs> I use the ATM in the bank, built into the wall. That I feel like that's more or less maintained and updated and stuff. Those little cheap ones with a wire, I don't trust them. At DEF CON, they hack them all the time, you know. Oh, well. Well, that's another option. Because yeah. even if the function is the wall is outside the bank, <coughs> I've seen Well, you know, I have some students who say, I don't use online banking, so I'm safe. And I say, well, you've removed one threat, but the threat of someone stealing your bank number from your laptop in the coffee house is really very small. The main thing they're going to do is hack into the bank and steal the whole database, and they still have that problem. Right. You go in the paper, they type it into a computer at the bank, and that gets hacked into, and that's mostly what happens. You go so, to a shady restaurant, they skim your credit card. Well, well that's yeah. true. That's why you could say, I'll be safe and use cash everywhere. Now you're still able to get robbed by someone with a gun yeah. because you're carrying a bunch of cash around. You know, there's just, this is why you have to do threat modeling. You can't stop every threat, so you have to decide what are you worried about enough to stop and what risks are you going to accept. Uh, the problem with the banking is people taking your, um, all your ID and all this stuff and asking for a loan. And that is yeah. what you should be scared of. Yeah. Um, but the other stuff? Yeah, well, there's a lot of things. Anyway, so HTTP, we know this is used to be the internet. Most everybody has updated HTTPS now. Very few sites are really using HTTP. Even if you are not logging in or viewing anything personal, you should never use HTTP because anybody can put themselves in the middle. They can add scripts to the page with a product like Beef or Burp. And so now most browsers, as of like last month, they will now all call, warn you that the page is insecure if it uses HTTP at all. To try to shame everybody into using HTTPS. And this is why Let's Encrypt came out to give everyone free certificates. So it should be easy and cheap for everyone to upgrade to HTTPS, and pretty much everybody is. In fact, when I demonstrated HTTP pages, it's hard to find them anymore, which is good. And I have to use the ones I put up just for my students to see. I used to be able to find them everywhere and demonstrate plain text logins everywhere. And those things are not common to find anymore, which is a good thing. Boot P is the precursor to DHCP to assign an address to a machine when it boots up. Very rarely used anymore. DHCP is what everyone uses. Your machine boots up, it sends out a broadcast message, it gets an IP address to use. It's a four way handshake system. Um, all right. And we got more cahoots about that stuff, which is going to be 4A4, I guess. All right. 5A4, okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
So, which utility sends packets with different TTL values? Trace route, good. So it can get a reply from every router it passes through. Which utility performs file transfers with no password? TFTP, FTP has a password. It sends it in plain text, but there is a password. TFTP sends it with no password at all. Kind of insane. Which protocol is on port 22? <clears throat> SSH. And which protocol has RR SIG? Oh, it's that's DNS check. So it's B, PC, and Robert. B, PC, and Robert. Okay. So, carry on with the net plus. I guess we're down to the second part of this. It's good. So, um, this will be 5B in the gooch now. So, you have electromagnetic interference, which might leak into your Ethernet cables. There's also crosstalk inside the cable from one wire pair to another, which is why Ethernet has four pairs, and each pair is twisted a different number of turns per inch, so that the crosstalk from one pair to the next will tend to cancel out over the length of the cable. The signal weakens through attenuation as it moves through the wire, and wireless signals attenuate much faster. So that's the unsfieldly twisted pair is the cheapest and most common cable where you have four pairs of wire and no shield around them. And there's these various categories. Almost everybody is now using CAT5E or CAT6. Um, by the way, a fun fact is that you don't, these speed limits are not absolute. They depend on the length of the cable. So you can run gigabit through an older cable if it's short. You just won't be able to go the full length unless you get the right grade. Shielded twisted pair just adds a layer of tinfoil on the outside to block outside interference. But that makes it more rigid to bend around corners and more expensive and people don't use it much. Coax is the thing that really can carry a lot of data. It is a waveguide with a geometric structure so you can send radio waves through it that bounce around and stay in the cable, sort of like fiber optics, although less perfect than fiber optics. And this is what you use for uh, cable TV and really broadband internet connections. You can only bend it around a certain radius. Bending it too much would break the perfection of the waveguide. Fiber optic is the fastest transmission medium. It is essentially perfect. Uh, single mode fiber optics is an essentially perfect medium. Um, you can move an incredible amount of data. I think 100 terabits per second is the theoretical upper limit of a fiber optic cable. The transmission medium is essentially perfect. It is the electronics at the end to send and receive the signal that limit your speed. And uh, they're run much slower than that for electronics that's affordable. Uh, it has almost no attenuation because Corning developed in the 60s or 70s a technique to take the impurities of the glass down to an extremely low level, like parts per billion, so the glass is so clear that it can carry a signal 50 miles. Um, so multimode fiber is the type that has a core around 50 or 62.5 microns, which means the light actually bounces crookedly going through there and that causes it to smear out. So it is relatively low bandwidth, but it is cheaper to use because you can use cheap LED sources on the ends that are big. Single mode fiber is so narrow in the core, eight microns across or six, that you, it only is possible for light to travel one way right down the center. So it does not smear out at all as it travels. And that is much, much faster, much, much more perfect. But the electronics is more expensive at both ends. Now you have to use a laser to create the light instead of a, a diode. And so if you have single mode fiber, and I suppose in multi-mode, although it's not as common there, you can send many colors of light through the same fiber. You don't use visible light, but you use the infrared just because of the physics of the situation. But you can send many um, 
packets at different wavelengths to the same fiber. They don't interfere with each other at all, as long as you don't uh, move to ridiculously high power levels. And so this is what happens is tissue like undersea cables, where laying the cable is very expensive, and you're willing to pay for really expensive electronics at both ends to get the most value out of that cable, you do wavelength division multiplexing. Normal networks like on a campus like this don't bother with that because it's easy enough to just lay more fiber. Lay more strands of fiber in the cable is a lot cheaper than buying the super expensive NICs at both ends. So you got Ethernet, which had became the king of local area networks, where you have one wire to each device and dumb switches that just look at the MAC address. And that turns out to be the cheapest way to get the job done. There have been, um, we moved from coaxial Ethernet with thin net and thick net to various generations of UTP Ethernet. And that's where we're, everybody's using this, except they're mostly moving to wireless these days. So CSMA CD is intended to make hubbed Ethernet work where it detects collisions, sends a jamming signal, and resends those packets. Uh, this was is pretty much no longer important for Ethernet because we use switches and there are almost no collisions, but it's important for wireless signals. But there you cannot detect a collision because the radio frequency attenuates. The way you detect a collision is you exceed the allowed voltage range. So if you were to have, although it's more complicated now, if you were to have a zero for a zero and five volts for a one, electricity that went up to 10 volts would tell you there'd been a collision. Two fives have added together. That's how you detect a collision. On wireless, you can't do that because the signal falls as the inverse square of the transmission. So there's no forbidden voltage range. So you have to use collision avoidance, which is fantastically ineffective. You have to send a signal saying, I am about to speak, everybody shut up, and then pause. Now you speak, now you wait for acknowledgement, then you say, okay, somebody else can speak now. That's what's happening on wireless networks. More than half of the entire bandwidth is wasted arguing about who's gonna talk next, and retransmitting frames that get destroyed. Wireless is fantastically inefficient. Which, you know, caught my attention, because when wireless came out, you had 11 megabits per second for 802.11b, and then 54 megabits per second for 802.11g, and I'm like, at that time, we had 56K modems, so why do you this megabits per second? And the point is, you only get a tiny fraction of that you can actually use. Most of it is wasted arguing about who's going to talk next. Anyway, um, so those are collisions. CSMA CA is what wireless networks use because they avoid collisions instead of detecting them. And um, the ArcNet and Token Ring are other all LAN protocols. Old one token ring, of course, was much more organized. There were no collisions. You'd pass a token around and you could only attach a packet if you wanted to do it, and then it would deliver it, and then one more person could talk. And so if you had a four megabit per second token ring network, you could really send four megabits per second of real data. Ethernet, you can only get up to about 10 or 20% of the rated speed before the collisions cause it to grind to a halt. So it's kind of a swindle and a ripoff. And it's sloppy and has a bunch of errors, which it then corrects, but it was cheaper to make the NICs and the switches, so it won in the marketplace. Doing it fast and sloppy and fixing your mistakes turned out to be the cheapest way to get the job done, as opposed to making a nice, clean, organized, beautiful network that did your job precisely. Yeah, the newest stock has changed hands. The newest what? The newest stock exchange. Yeah, the stock exchange. Yeah, yeah. The financial companies still continue to use it. Anyway, FIDI was an old uh, protocol used uh, with two layers of fiber to get up to 100 megabits per second. It was fault tolerant because if you cut the cable, it would send the data the other way around the loop so it could withstand one cable cut and keep working. And so land topologies, you got the bus, you got the old uh, coax lines, you got the trees, which is what most people really have. And then you have a ring for like token ring. Um, and a star is what everyone's really using in Ethernet networks. You have a switch in the middle and everybody has their own cable. Um, mesh is what's on the internet, a partial mesh. A full mesh is where every device has a direct line to every other device and almost nobody can ever afford that at any scale. So what you have is a partial mesh like the internet where there, every device has several connections. So there are many possible paths, but not all possible paths. All right. And so this would be 5B1. So let me try and remove some of the ones I'm not using. See if that makes things any better. All right. Five B one. I see five. There's five B one. Okay, good. All right. <clears throat>
So if you put cables near fluorescent lights, what happens? <coughs> the electromagnetic interference. EMP is just like nuclear bombs. That's a different problem. What's the most common kind of Ethernet cable? Unshielded twisted pair. That's the common cheap garden variety cable. Which LAN used two fiber rings? All net plus stuff. Fiddy. And what's the physical topology of an Ethernet LAN? It's a star, one switch in the middle and a separate cable for each device. All right, Jane, Robert, and B. I got Jane and B and Robert. Okay. So, get rid of that and go back to here and all right, so then there's WAN protocols. You have the T carriers and the European E carriers, T1 and T3 and so on, which originally were a big thick bundle of copper wires and now we're all pretty much fiber or coax. Um, Sonnet is what you do if you have really want a lot of bandwidth. Those are the really high bandwidth, the expensive things that go up to like 15,000 megabits per second and such. Um, Frame relay was intended to make virtual circuits so you can have an allocated amount of bandwidth to each person and all the traffic is in fact shared. Um, you make a permanent virtual circuit or a switched virtual circuit so one customer would get a fixed amount of bandwidth. Um, X25 is an older protocol doing more or less the same thing. ATM is in great use with these fixed size 53 byte cells. Um, all your data is broken up in these little packets and sent along these networks. It's used on the WAN from ISP to ISP and big companies to big companies, not on the LAN. <coughs> MPLS is multi-protocol label switching that can carry many different kinds of traffic over the same network and attempt to deal with different types of WAN protocols. Um, SDLC and HDLC are more of these WAN protocols that have uh, various ways of error correcting and polling for bandwidth and such. HDLC had a normal response mode, an asynchronous and an asynchronous balance mode, uh, various modes for WANs. And the only people that need to know this are people running telcos and such. Then there are converged networks where you're on many kinds of traffic over the same network. So um, you'll have a one device running everything. This is one of the things that people try to do when they went to voice, voice over IP. Now you just need a data net wires. You don't need separate telephone wires and data wires coming into your building. DNP3 is another open standard used by the energy sector for SCADA devices to connect in a smart grid. And uh, you can put it over TCP IP, but there are other ways to do it too. And there are storage protocols, which are intended to connect data storage arrays to servers, uh, such as fiber channel and fiber channel over ethernet and iSCSI. These are what you use if you have a storage area network, you then uh, have clusters of servers all serving out data. Um, so fiber channel uses a special cable and hardware. The fiber is not necessarily fiber optics. It refers to the uh, logical layout of it, where you have many, many parallel wires connecting one device to another, forming like a fiber. Fiber channel over ethernet uses ethernet, but not TCP IP. And um, these are all used in short range from one device to another in the same data center. They're not long range protocols. iSCSI is another way to do it. You can route storage devices over a LAN or a WAN, and it, you can then access storage devices remotely. And this is what's going on with services like uh, OneDrive and Dropbox. They have these big data centers. If you take the storage classes, the uh, last several years, all these teaching conventions had these uh, EMI, I think, was kind of, had these storage classes, to, uh, trying to get students to learn about storage. Because there's a bunch of these storage protocols and techniques that are not really covered in normal network classes. And uh, it's an ever-growing business. I think, was it EM, EMC or EMI? Yes. They bought VMware. They're like the number seven biggest company in America, and nobody's heard of them. Dell bought them back. Dell bought them back. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, there's a whole 
baffling world of storage technology that they're doing to make everything work and they're tired of nobody knowing how to do it so they had a push to try to train us and add those classes we didn't do it but maybe some of your colleges did add those storage classes anybody teaching that stuff yeah the main thing I noticed is I went to one of these conferences. And I was teaching like my class and other people in your class. And the poor EMC people would go back to the hotel room and study all night because they really had to pass the certification test on the last day. And that stuff is really hard. There was a lot of stuff in that book. And they were suffering greatly to get their storage certification. Anyway, virtual SANs are virtual story area area networks like a VLAN. And you have, of course, voice over IP where you ring the phone with SIP session initiation protocol and you pick up the phone that negotiates the session and once you have it you send the data with rtp or uh, srtp which moves the actual voice traffic over and this is great fun i remember i learned how to wiretap voice white phone calls and i thought that was awesome anyway um you can totally play them back right in wireshark now you can just right click on the steam and play it back through the speakers unless it's encrypted of course almost nobody encrypts it though because it turns out to require a lot more bandwidth than the advertisers tell you. So everybody gets miserable performance and everybody turns off all the security to make it faster. I don't know if that's changed yet, but that was the standard at least a few years ago, that in practice, almost nobody used the encryption. I don't know if it's gotten better, but I doubt it. Saves money. That's highly questionable. It turns out, people tell me it really, it really costs you $1,000 per phone to set up real VoIP. The reason people do it is not to save money. They do it to get the features, like press one for this, press two for that, and call forwarding and all the cool features you get from VoIP. Anyway. There's a really cheap one called, not cheap, like inexpensive, called UMA, O-O-M-A. I've heard UMA, yeah, UMA. You only pay the taxes, which is what I use at home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for home users, there's also one called Magic 8 and Packet 8 and stuff. There's a bunch of cheap ones for home users, but the enterprise customers, end up wanting all these features so it can be connected to your voicemail and everything is now IP and stored in your data. Sure. It's not really to save money to get all the cool features. My tell, those, you know. <coughs> yeah, and of course, even what you think of as an analog phone call is really just packetized and going through the same packet network now anyway. Um, Software-defined networks is where it's all going. We have virtual servers, virtual routers, virtual firewalls, virtual cables. And they're running virtual network traffic everywhere. That's where we're all headed. I, I assume there'll be a, I think there is already a Cisco uh, software defined network certification or something like it. And that's where it's all going. Um, OpenFlow is the most well known software defined network protocol. There may be others. Do you know which one Cisco's training about now? What's the protocol? Is it OpenFlow or do they have their own proprietary or something? Anyway, knowing them, they probably have a proprietary one. It's probably better. That would be normal for Cisco. All right, uh, so this should be 5B2, which is here, okay? Yeah, all right. So which one goes to 45 megs? I think it was ATM, no, it's T3s, okay. Well, I used to know this stuff. Which one is a storage protocol? <laughs> Fiber channel over Ethernet. Which protocol is used by SCADA devices in the energy sector? Well, I can get there by uh, logic. DNP3 is the only one I don't know about. All right, so. And the most well known SDN protocol for software defined networks. <laughs> Open flow. Okay. Anyway, PC Robert and Jane. PC Robert and Jane. Okay. And we got 
40 minutes to lunch, so we can do at least one more of these, maybe two. All right, so wireless local area networks, of course. Um, you can deny service on wireless networks very easily by just emitting noisy radio or by sending disassociation frames, which are unauthenticated and disconnect people. Um, there is no defense to this. It is one of the weaknesses of wireless networks. Um, wireless networks are forced to use the unlicensed bands. Most of the electromagnetic spectrum is reserved by the Federal Communications Commission to be used for certain purposes. And so everybody is crammed into 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz bands for all the wireless devices, which are proliferating all over the place, except for the very newest ones that are moving up to 60 or 100 gigahertz and not commonly used yet, like 802.11 AD. Frequency hopping sped spectrum is a way to keep changing the frequency to penetrate interference. I think it was actually invented by Hetty Lamar for World War II and patented by her. In addition to being an actress, she was a technologist. Yeah. Yeah. Dioth, yeah. Yes, everybody is using wireless devices and they're just hoping to luck. If you set your laptop to send Dioth frames, it would disconnect them. And if one person in like a conference did this, nobody could use the wireless and there's no way to find them because there's no address in those frames. The only thing you could do is bring in a directional radio and try to track them down that way, which is not going to work very well indoors for the signals. So it is pretty nuts how much everybody trusts this is like the internet. I mean, the Yank Kaminsky, I like what he says, the internet was designed to share cat pictures. And now people are trusting it with their money and their life and their medical calls and their everything. And then they're wondering why it's not secure enough for that. Well, it was, people did not design it with that use in mind. And now we're trying to bolt on enough security to make it reliable. It's a problem. Um, yeah. Um, I was LASIK uh, five years ago, six years ago. I'll tell you, I'll tell you that they, they, they have these computers on these uh, little Cards. Yeah. You are logged in. Yeah. In hospital. Never log out. Yeah, yeah. They never do anything. <clears throat> I mean, literally, it's right there. Oh, yeah. You can actually even, if you take your phone and play with any of these things, you can see what she's doing. The only thing that is locked out is her drawer. Yeah. So she opens the drawer for the drugs. Yeah. And if she doesn't close it, it rings. Or um, if it opens, and that's it. That's the only thing that's secure. Your information, it's, it's crap. It's so bad. Well, this is actually a big issue, and I should point out we are the cavalry. This is the group. Um, this guy named Josh Corman was a security professional and engineer, and he decided to try to improve government protocols about security. So he went to legislators and she wanted to talk to them about all these security problems. And he said, they said, I don't understand what you're talking about and no one's gonna vote for me because of that issue. And he said, well, what issue would interest you? And they said, medical device security. If people are dying because of computer security, then I can understand that and so can the voters. So he focused on that and formed this group called I Am The Cavalry, which a lot of people are doing. It's a volunteer organization and they've been focusing on medical security. And they have found a bunch of hospital equipment that can be hacked into and they've got some of it fixed and they've got some laws changed and everything. So they're, they're really focusing on this issue and they have a lot of good successes now and they are celebrities of all the conferences, the gang of people in there give their special talks in their special room. And a lot of people go, I went and hung out in that last B sides. They had a lot of good talks, all focusing on security and government and law and legislation and very clever. So this is, um, and his goal was to make some kind of security organization that represents security professionals like the AMA. The AMA is a lobbying organization that goes to Washington and helps them write laws that will not hurt the doctors. And security professionals don't have one, and we need one. And when he formed this about six years ago at B-Sides, he announced it, and I was, as usual, the firebrand in the room. And I said, you know, Mike, he wanted to focus it on privacy and, and hiding stuff from the government and encryption and everything. And I said, don't pick something that splits us. Half of us are the government and the Fed. If you're going to represent the security industry, you have to stick to the security industry and not pick a fashionable thing that people will cheer for that we don't all agree on. And we don't all agree that you should be hiding all your data with maximum encryption. Some of us are in the FBI and the government and the Fed, so knock it off. And I think it kind of did. Now he focuses on medical security, which we can all agree on. 
that's what you got to do if you're going to be a real organization representing the the industry is to represent something we can all believe in and anyway it's, it's really quite successful it's growing right along and so he, I think he wants to be elected to Congress or something or become a lobbyist or something. I don't know quite where it's all going, but it is beginning to be security information reaching the government in a way that they can understand and use it. And hopefully the goal is we'll end up with some well-known security experts who can advise Congress and legislators who they will listen to and help them write better laws. Because right now they're lost and in the soup and writing stupid laws that don't work because... Yeah, well, that's why they don't know. Yeah. They really need help. <clears throat> and they need uh, people who can help them understand it and talk their language and treat them with respect. Anyway, so, um, all right. So, uh, frequency hopping sped spectrum, direct sequence sped spectrum uh, uses a whole band, and there's orthogonal frequency division multiplexing where you use multiple of wavelengths, just like um, wavelength division multiplexing, you can have frequencies that don't interfere with each other. So, for example, different polarization levels and such moving through uh, a channel. So, 802.11 is where it all started with really slow wireless networks that almost nobody used. The one that really hit the market was 802.11b. That was the big one that Wi Fi came out. And then 802.11g came out at 54, and then N was the new hotness about five, six years ago that took us up to like 600 megs. And now there's 802.11ac, which is becoming common. I know my Mac supports it, all, and you can buy home devices for it. They get you up to about one gigahertz. And after that, there's 802.11ad to get you up to 10 gigahertz, I think. To get a pack, but it's um, only short range. And it's intended to replace all the local cables between your keyboard and your monitor and everything. Your wireless card has the firmware in your wireless NIC has four modes. Managed is the only mode a normal person uses. This is where you are a client and you connect to the access point, which is a master. Therefore, Windows drivers only support this mode. But if you want to hack into networks, you want these other modes. You want ad hoc, which is point to point with no router. And you really want monitor mode, which is like promiscuous, where you can listen to all the traffic that is not addressed to you. And you also want to do injection, where you're going to send out traffic with a false MAC address, so it appears to come from someone else. That's what you really need to hack into web networks. And that's why, if you go to DEF CON, they're selling old wireless cards, which have this ability. Most wireless cards, all wireless cards are all made by like the three manufacturers, and then rebranded with 100 brands on the outside. There's really only like three fundamental pieces of hardware being used. And the, the ones for which there are available hacked drivers are prized, and these old cards are valuable. Um, and people have tried to find devices that can do the hacking. But of course, the hacking is pretty much gone because the only protocol you could really hack into is web. WPA and WPA2 are very hard to hack into. Uh, and most everybody has finally stopped using web. So I took it out of my hacking class, and wireless hacking has pretty much gone down. Um, I think with the demise of web, wireless security has gone way up to where there's not that much in the way of wireless attacks. There are a couple of attacks on WPA, but they're very weak and not something to worry about. So the NIC now has, doesn't have all these four. Oh, the Once NIC, the hardware can do all four it. modes, but oh, typically your driver doesn't let you have them. If you're using oh, Windows, okay. you can only have managed mode. Yeah. Because Windows is not designed to give you full control of the hardware. It's just designed to make it easy for you to do the normal thing. All right. So um, the SSID is the name of the network that you see here assigned there. You can disable SSID broadcasts, but that is a weak security measure because people can still sniff with something like Wireshark or Kismet to see the networks. And also that means you can't roam. If you have a, a wireless network with several access points, like at a college, you can pick up a laptop and start a download and carry your laptop from one room to another. And it will listen to the broadcasts and notice when it's getting further from this one and closer to that one, and then switch to that one and let your download continue, just like your cell phone does. You move from one tower to the next and it negotiates a reconnection so you can continue to have your call. But if you turn off the broadcast, you can't do that. So turning off broadcast is an early recommended security measure that in retrospect is considered stupid and probably not worth the bother. MAC address filtering is another weak security measure, which you might do just to stop your neighbor from using your wireless router, or I used to use it to stop people from using my phone as a router at a coffee house, but it's trivial to beat. You can just, on an unencrypted wireless network, you can just sniff the traffic, find out what MAC address is allowed, 
kick them off with a DAUTH frame and connect with their MAC address and now I'm in. So it, because it has the same fundamental problem as Telnet and FTP, you're sending an identifier unencrypted. So anybody can just sniff the traffic and find the identifier. WEP was the original protocol to uh, comfort consumers who were suspicious of wireless technology by lying to them and making them think it was as safe as a wire and naming it wired equivalent privacy. I think within the first year of it being out, people discovered how terrible it was. And ever since 2001, it has been known to be ridiculous. You can totally break into a web network without doing anything. You can just listen to the traffic and perform a mathematical analysis on it and find the key. And if you can inject traffic, you can break into it in like two or three minutes. It's just appalling. Um, nobody should use it ever for anything. <laughs> anyway, um, 802.11i defined a uh, robust security network, and that was WPA2. Um, WPA was a stop app protocol intended to fix the weaknesses in web, and it was intended to be a firmware update to devices that were designed to run only web. So it was based on web with only a small modification, <coughs> and all it is is web, but you keep changing the key for every packet, so you cannot gather a lot of packets with the same key, so you can't do the math to crack it. And they thought it would probably get hacked pretty soon because it's pretty much the same thing as WEP. But in fact, that did not happen. In fact, you put four little band-aids over the four mistakes in WEP, and it turned out nothing else was ever found. So this, in fact, was perfectly fine. But like um, triple dish, it was a patch on the old broken thing that was okay, but the new thing, WPA2, is faster and better on modern hardware. So Bluetooth is for short-range um, devices like earpieces and such. Uh, it had an earlier version with no encryption and slower to later versions are faster and things like Bluetooth keyboards are now encrypted for pretty strongly. Um, it can use various stream ciphers. Apparently this E0 stream cipher is weak. I think there might be a later version of something better. So, uh, yeah. Let's go back. Yeah. So 128-bit. No, no, no. Next, next, next slide. Yeah, 128-bit cipher. It would be all right. The key is long enough, but apparently there's something else wrong with it. I mean, 128 bit is a long enough key, key. but apparently you have some other defect in the cipher. So yeah. the true strength is only 30 Yeah, apparently so. Yeah, that's pretty awful. So I, I, I should put that in my encryption class if I figure out how to do that. We should crack that. That sounds like a fun project. I haven't looked into e this thing, but that looks great. I love breakable things. They make good hacking projects. Um, yeah. Anyway. Anyway, RFID is, is how you tag devices like barcodes with these radio frequency IDs that can be read supposedly only for a few inches, although you can build your own more powerful radio with a bigger antenna and detect, detect them right. Uh, a famous hacker, um, Chris Paget, I think is the name, went, he had made a video where he, he took, um, or she, I guess, took some homemade $500 of radio equipment and took an antenna and taped it around the window of a car and drove down Market Street in San Francisco and they were able to read the passport numbers off of people walking by because they put RFID tags in passports. This was the Bush administration that did that. They wanted to put RFID tags in passports and they hired a bunch of technological consultants and they universally said, no, don't do it. That is a terrible idea. Just use barcodes. And so they did it without any explanation. And so now, if you're like in Beirut and you want to kidnap an American, you can just use a radio to find the American, which is crazy. And that's why a lot of people get these tinfoil wallets with a layer of metal to block the RFIDs, because we're all tagged with little tags that can detect you, which is a lot of the more paranoid people say this is an evil government plot to track everybody everywhere. Um, and I don't know. Cell phones have totally done that anyway. Like say, Americans have one privacy until you give them like a cat video, and now you can have all their privacy forever. So everybody carries a cell phone, which is totally tracking you everywhere you go. And that's totally available to law enforcement and every, and they're selling it to advertisers and everybody and to private detectives and everybody. And nobody cares about that, but they're worried about your ID card being scanned. You know. Anyway, um, so if you want to stop this, you put wire around and ground it like a Faraday cage that will block radio signals. This is how you protect anything you want from uh, signals going in or out. All right. Yeah, a tinfoil or a wire mesh, yeah. The wire has to be mesh smaller than the wavelength of whatever you want to stop. And it has to be a good conductor and it has to be grounded. 
and then you can block radio coming in and out. So I think it is uh, number three here. Yeah, yeah, Faraday bags. And, yeah, you can do that, but you have to remember it. Well, it should probably have tinfoil in them by default, but they don't. <coughs> I think so, yes. Yeah, there's a bunch of them again. We got someone still joining? I think the back row people may have wandered away. All right, we'll carry on with four. Are you, are you joining? Oh, good, okay. All right, fair enough. Good. All right. It was you. All right, good. So, uh, all right. Wait, what's this? We've already done this one. Well. Okay, we've already done this one. So, let me see what. What's going on here? Somebody is incompetent around here. This would be 5B3, I thought. Oh, that's 5A3. 5B3. Oh. Okay. That'll do it. Let's continue to remove the ones I'm... All right. 5B3. Okay. Let's see if this looks better. Okay, what mode connects two devices together like a crossover cable? That's ad hoc mode, as opposed to infrastructure mode where you have a gateway and you're all sharing it. Simultaneous transmissions that do not interfere with each other, what are they? <laughs> That's orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. Orthogonal means the signals don't interfere with each other. So which one runs at five gigahertz? The OTLM A did. That's why, even though it was faster, it was never adopted much because 5 gigahertz is shorter range. So B became the one that everyone used. Even though it was slower, it went further. And N uses both to make it faster. Yeah, and uses both of them, and it actually uses spatial channels, which is bloody insane. You have three antennas at both ends, and it will bounce one wave off the roof and one off the floor and one off the wall and use those, call them spatial channels, to move more data. N is basically a whole bunch of G channels in parallel, sort of like uh, DSL lines. DSL lines are bloody insane. They take the waveform and they use every subtle alteration in the waveform, not just up and down, but... Um, phase and small frequency changes and small amplitude changes and they probe the line to determine what level of noise there is in all these degrees of freedom and optimize it to move as much data as possible which is why the speed depends on how close you are to the receiver and 802.11n is similar it's very complicated figuring out how to ram the most data down the channel which technology blocks radio signals <clears throat> Yep, the Faraday cage, of course. All right. And we're up to 11.40. I guess we can do one more, or at least part of one more. So it's T, B, and Robert. Okay. T and B and Robert. Robert's doing very well. Right. Now, 
Mac Roberts now tied for the lead. All right. So you got at OSI layer one, you've got repeaters and hubs. A repeater just regenerates a signal to make it go further. A hub is a multi-port repeater where a signal is copied in many places. Um, bridges were the original way to bridge two networks. So the bridge would learn the MAC addresses on the left and the MAC addresses on the right, and it would then decide whether to send a packet through or not, or frame through or not, I should say. Happen at layer two, switches are multi-port bridges that have an internal memorized table of MAC addresses, and they know which device is connected to which port, and they will send it just out the right port. VLANs enable you to add an extra tag, which is outside the normal protocol. It was a non-standard protocol, and that's why they have 802.11q. After Cisco made these as a proprietary technology, and it was so successful it was built into the real technology. So now you have another label, and this is, violates the OSI model. You have a label between layer two and layer three. So now, in addition to the MAC address, you have a network number, which is which virtual land you're on, and now you can have many devices connected to the same switch and have the traffic still separated into different virtual local area networks. So this is the beginning of the movement towards virtualization, where the logical layout, logical topology is separated from the physical topology. And just like virtual servers and virtual networks, this turned out to be enormously valuable. So you can lay the physical layout however you want, and you can have a logical layout that is not tied to the physical layout. Does it provide a gap? Yes, it provides a gap between them. And it also means, you, like at our college, all the CNET department computers on one VLAN, even though they're in different buildings, and the CS is on a different, and the engineering is on a different, you can have a virtual local area network that is not tied to the physical topology, and that turns out to be really useful. <coughs> so port isolation is where you prevent one port from talking to another port. Um, that's a private VLAN. And by segmenting your network, you make uh, lateral movement much more difficult for the attacker. I know my college is divided into 100 VLANs, and most people are. You Once you get into it, you realize everything should be separate. The financials should be separate from the grade, separate than each department, separate than the student lab, separate from the wireless. You know, these things should all be segmented differently because they have different security requirements. So that's the game. You isolate tenants from each other in a multi-tenant environment like a server farm or a cloud server like Amazon where many people are sharing the same device. You separate them this way. Span ports are ports that can see all the traffic passing through the switch. Although simple logic would tell you that if I have a 32 port switch running at say 100 megabits per second, the span, if they're all really running at maximum speed, the span port can't possibly deliver all the packets. So it doesn't actually work very well when the switch gets fully loaded, which is why if you seriously get into network monitoring, you have to pay for special devices called network taps. These span ports are only useful on low volume networks. But anyway, that's a way to get uh, a copy of all the ports so you can pass it to a network monitoring device. Network taps are the better solution here. Um, for high bandwidth networks. Routers at layer three move your data from one network to another and they have a routing table where they've memorized which way to send packets to get to other networks. Um, so you have network address translation as we talked about where local addresses are converted by the router at the top that has two NICs, one going to the local network and a separate NIC going to the internet and it routes traffic from the LAN to the WAN. So the routers have to have dynamic routing tables as links go up and down, so they learn where they can get to and which links happen to be down. So originally you have manual routing where the administrator has to type in the addresses, but everybody uses dynamic routing on all large networks, where it is sending data over the same network to tell routers what the routing table is, which is kind of unsanitary and dangerous, and in fact there are a bunch of attacks on it, like the ones that happened yesterday that brought down Cloudflare and some Google services and everything for three hours because of a bad update that went through Verizon. Um, this practice of sending essential traffic control signals down the same wire as the data is unsanitary and dangerous and leads to an endless series of vulnerabilities. And BGP is the worst offender. Um, Mudge went before Congress 20 years ago and testified that the internet is fragile and I could bring down the whole internet at any time and you shouldn't be trusting it with military and sensitive data and nothing has changed. We're still using the same BGP 
and even the largest telecom company providers have still not implemented even the most basic BGP defenses. So they get false updates all the time. I see these go by every month or two. A major BGP error or attack happens, which reroutes a lot of traffic from one part of the world to another part of the world or blocks it. Um, it is kind of insane. And that's the exterior gateway protocol used for large rate traffic between ISPs is border gateway protocol, which just sells them to reroute like all the traffic from one city to a different city. And those things are unauthenticated and unverified. <laughs> there are protocols available to verify them, but they're not very standard and a lot of people don't implement them. Even huge networks like Verizon don't seem to implement them correctly. So the distance vector routing protocols are the old ones where it doesn't even know how you can see a full network topology. It just knows which direction and how many hops it is. That was RIP very primitive. It doesn't even know the difference between a fast connection and a slow connection. So it does not really choose the best route. And in fact, it frequently gets confused and sets up routing loops where packets go around in circles instead of getting where they're going for up to 10 minutes at a time. So it was pretty lame. It was the first dynamic routing protocol and quickly replaced by better routing protocols. Here's an example of a routing loop. You try to send something somewhere and it just bounces back and back, back and forth between two devices that have a wrong idea where to forward it. That was RIP, the old inefficient one. And uh, there were a bunch of complicated techniques to make RIP less uh, easily fooled that were not enormously effective. And what's much better, we moved up to link state routing protocols as routers got stronger and they had enough RAM and processor. Each router then had the whole network diagram. So they understood what they were doing far more than a RIP networks. And that's what OSPF was the open version and Cisco had their proprietary one. And these converged much faster and were much more accurate and did not have much of a problem of routing loops. BGP is the one protocol used to move from one ISP to another. And again, it's fundamentally very old and insecure. It's tied to IP version four in a way that cannot be removed. So updating IP version six is problematic at best. And there are just many, many defects in BGP. Hey there. Can I get you some swag? Is um, it possible to search for it? Oh. Uh, 2XL, if you got it. Thank you. I appreciate it. are handing out swag. Anyway, so, all right. So we got some cahoots, and then I think we're ready. We're, we're at time for lunch. So this will be number four. And, you know, I went through that pretty fast because I've noticed you people seem to know your NetPlus. I think everybody here has taught NetPlus or Cisco or something of that sort. <clears throat> but I really feel for all the managers with an MBA that try to learn this stuff and say, get lost in the soup. All right. So which device is it OSI 3? Router, of course. Which device moves packets from land to the internet? It's the router, of course. Which protocol used hop count? A switch moves a switch moves packets on the land only from device to device, not to the web. Yeah, this will find the CCNAs in the room. That's RIP. RIP used top count. See, by the way, there is a thing called a layer three switch, which violates these rules, of course. That's the, but switches, I know, that's what happens is you define the rules and immediately somebody makes a device that breaks the rules, like VLANs or like hardware virtualization. So all these rules don't really work. And always the newest, most exciting thing breaks the rules. That's, yeah. Yeah, so layer three switches, I know. Layer three switches actually do routing at the switch level. There's a technical difference, but I don't remember it. Maybe somebody knows. Layer th yeah. That's faster. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that's why, you know. Yeah. But you're right. Layer three switches kind of violate these rules, but almost every real device violates a lot of these rules. So the correct, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you. So the correct question is 
the answer is if you're using a layer three, it's a if you're using a layer three, it would have been layer three, of course, yeah. But normal switches are in layer two. Uh, layer two. The layer three switch has that name because it's a special switch that. So a router is normally in layer three. A router is always in layer three, yeah. Good. All right, so this is RIP. Uh, routing, RIP used hop count as a measure of distance, not even any measure of the speed of the link, which was really, really sloppy and not very efficient. So a LAN routing protocol that converges rapidly. At OSPF, open shortest pass first. That was the replacement for RIP that was really much better. All right. So it's Robert, T, and B. Robert and T and B. All right, so uh, I guess we ought to go to lunch and we'll carry on later. We are here at slide 162. I'll just make a note of that fact so I know where to pick up. And I'm going to stop the Zoom share and pick it up again at 1. All right.